sisters and brothers in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? You probably knew the answer to that question. On earth as it is in heaven. We often talk about heaven and the kingdom of heaven, also referred to as the kingdom of God, as where we want to go when we die. But as Dallas Willard points out, heaven, at its most basic, refers to any place where God's will is being done, where we are living by God's values, where God is in charge. And Jesus came proclaiming the presence of the kingdom of heaven or sometimes called the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is available on this earth in this life when we are doing God's will. And the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is exactly that. It is where God's will is done because people are living by God's values. And as Willard goes on, he reminds us that the Gospels are really more about how to live in God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, how to live by God's values on this earth, in these earthly bodies, in this life. It's much more about that, much more than it is about getting to heaven when we die. And this is not a bunch of rules, but it's advice to follow. And it's the best advice. Now, this slide made me laugh because I don't know how many advertisements I've seen for self-help books, and they all claim in one way or another that they will give you the best advice ever and they will solve all your problems. You know, I, I once walked into a Barnes & Noble and asked, a, asked one of the clerks, where the self-help section was, he says, you need to find that yourself. It didn't help me a bit. But if, if these self-help books really worked, we wouldn't need Jesus and we wouldn't need the Gospels. In the Sermon on the Mount, of which we just heard Pastor Bob read the first few verses, Jesus addresses two major questions that humanity has faced throughout all of history. First, he asks, what does it mean to live the good life? What is genuinely in my interest? How can I genuinely experience well-being? The best way to phrase this might simply be to ask, who has the good life? And there's a second question he's addressing here, which is, how then do we live? If you want to genuinely be a good person with the kind of goodness found in God, resulting in a family likeness or a family, resembl or a family resemblance with God and God's people, how would you want to live? Put another way, what does living by God's values look like? Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the Mount, addressing those two great questions, have proven to be some of the most influential and important teachings ever on these subjects. Maybe the best teachings ever on these subjects. Along with some other important biblical texts, such as, such as the 23rd Psalm, the Lord's Prayer, Ten Commandments. They provide us with an important look at what is actually good for us. But what should we actually do? How should we live in response to them? Now, I just identified two questions, but this message today will really only focus on the first one, which is this, who, according to Jesus, has the good life? Now, because we're made for relationship with God, life in God's kingdom participating in God's kingdom, and even in the life of God, God's self, gives us the best life possible. 
Put another way, God's kingdom is available to us now, today, in this life. And we need to ask what it means to participate in God's work in the world in relationship with God and in God's kingdom by God's values. As I mentioned a couple weeks ago, if we turn to the Beatitudes, or if we turn the Beatitudes or the entire Sermon on the Mount into a list of rules we have to follow, it will be impossible. And we might therefore entirely reject Christianity or simply walk around feeling guilty because we think we're not good enough. But as Christian ethicist David Gushy points out, we need to remember that it is Jesus who preached this sermon and that it is because of Jesus' death and resurrection that we are saved by God's grace. So we need to read and understand this sermon through a grace-colored lens. Two weeks ago, I focused on verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Last week, Pastor Bob focused on verses 4 and 5. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Which brings us to verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. It's important to realize this isn't people who are righteous. It's people who burn with desire for righteousness, who want things to be made right, who are hungry and thirsty for things being fixed in this world. As late Pastor Frederick Beekner pointed out, we might be tempted to guess that Jesus would pick one sort or another of spiritual hero, men and women of impeccable credentials, spiritually, humanly, and every which way, morally. And those people would be on his list of those who are blessed. So he might have said, blessed are the good people, the people who are the most righteous. But that's not what he said here. Jesus' list of blessed people might seem upside down to us. Now maybe Jesus didn't name the maybe he didn't name the perfect people the people who might have seemed obvious to us because he didn't need they didn't need a shot in the arm by getting that kind of mentioned but maybe he didn't pick the perfect people the perfectly righteous people because there aren't any be that as it may, it's worth noting the ones he did pick out to identify as blessed. These are the people who you and I might not put on the blessed list. And they're people who might not have been welcome in the worship communities of first century Judaism because they weren't seen as being good enough at living within God's covenant or keeping ceremonially clean, for example. Jesus' list of who would be blessed, as we just heard, includes those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake. The ones who want things to be made right. Now, there are a few different ways we can understand this idea of hunger and thirst for righteousness. To quote Pastor Beekner again, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are not the ones who are righteous, but the ones who hope they will be someday, and in the meantime are well aware that the distance they still have to go is even greater than the distance they've already gone. They are aware of their own flaws. In other words, this would include people who are aware that what's wrong, or at least part of what's wrong and has to be fixed, is in themselves. Maybe they've sinned, they've failed, they have messed up so badly that they cringe at their own mess up and they inwardly scream to be made pure. Maybe they simply know that, in some way, they have a problem. They know that something is wrong. As Christ followers, we believe 
we believe that the thing, the thing that is wrong is that we are separated from God because of our human condition. And we recognize that as a problem because we are made for a relationship with God. So we need God's love and grace. We need God to set us free from what separates us from God by the power of Jesus' death and resurrection. The Greek word dikaiosune, often translated as righteousness, well, it, it comes from the Greek word dika, and it's also related to concepts of justice and what Paul tells us in his letter to the Romans is justification. Righteousness, justification, justice. Paul tells us that we are justified or made righteous. We're made right with God by God's grace through the redemption that comes from Jesus Christ. Now, most American Christians don't talk much about justification anymore, even though the question of how it is that we are justified or made righteous, they're both translations of the Greek, even though this has been a big topic of theological debate for centuries, usually now we just say saved. So when we're saved, when we're justified, when we're made righteous by Jesus, what exactly does that mean? And while we probably think we know the answer, believe it or not, theologians have been arguing about this topic for centuries. What does it mean to be justified or saved? And a related question, how does Jesus' death atone for or cover our sin? How does Jesus' death save us? The church has historically given three answers to this question as to how Jesus' death justifies or saves us. And each of them has some variations, but I'll just summarize here. It's important to realize that all three of these answers have some biblical support. The most common approach in American Christianity is to focus on God forgiving us, on forgiveness. The idea that Jesus paid for our sins on the cross. He paid a debt we could never repay. So we can be forgiven because, as some would say it, if you're in Jesus, when God looks at you, God doesn't see your sin or your mess-uppedness. God sees Jesus. We're forgiven because of Jesus. Another approach has been to say that Jesus' death sets an example for us of what it means to love others, actually being willing to die for others. And it then inspires us to love others too. Jesus tells us, love one another as I have loved you. Now, I'd like to believe this is true, that Jesus inspires us to be more loving. But I think it only makes sense if it's joined to one of the other two understandings of Jesus' death and resurrection, which provide a substantive explanation of why Jesus' death saves us. And I'm skeptical, as was Martin Luther, of our ability to make nearly as much progress as we'd like to make on our own. Early church theologians, for example, the people who wrote the Nicene Creed, had a third understanding of how Jesus atones for our sin, how Jesus justifies us, how Jesus makes us righteous, how Jesus saves us. They talked and wrote in some different ways about Jesus defeating the power of the devil, what Martin Luther later often referred to as sin, death, and the devil. We might today say that Jesus overcame the power of evil in the world. And, therefore, Jesus sets us free from the power of sin, restores our relationship with God, and this happens because he won the victory when he rose from the dead. Jesus sets us free from a trap we were in. In this view, Jesus had to die so that he could rise. Because in rising, he wins the victory. We use language like this when we say confession. We talk about being in bondage to sin or captive to sin. And it's the way Martin Luther talked about what Jesus does for us when he wrote his small catechism. 
in this view, which is still held by the Orthodox Church, after Jesus sets us free from the power of sin, justification or being made righteous is an ongoing process. It's not that we say a prayer, we repent or come to faith, and we get forgiven, and that's it. It's an ongoing, lifelong process. God works on us over our lives, making us more righteous, making us more Christ-like over time by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. So we get to participate in God's kingdom. We get to participate in God's work in the world. The power of the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of Christ, makes us holy. The Holy Spirit is Christ in us, allowing us to be little Christs, and both inspiring and empowering us to love our neighbors. So righteousness is something that God gives us, but it is also something we do. It's how we live differently as God makes us righteous as a gift of God's grace. David Gushy adds another another layer to this understanding of righteousness by pointing to Isaiah chapter 61. Many of the images in the Beatitudes echo this passage in Isaiah. For example, the chapter begins with a reference to those who are oppressed. And then in verse 3, Isaiah writes, They, meaning those who are poor and oppressed, will be called oaks of righteousness. And in verse 13, he writes, So the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up, to spring up before all nations. The Hebrew word translated as righteousness in Isaiah refers to rescuing and releasing the oppressed and restoring people who are outcasts, people who are powerless, restoring those people to their place as part of God's covenant community. Just as God rescued the, rescued the Hebrews from slavery and oppression in Egypt, God is on the side of the poor, the powerless, and the oppressed. It may be that only people who have been poor, oppressed, or excluded from community can fully grasp this aspect of righteousness. But it does show us that God calls us to work for justice, to work to deliver people from alienation and oppression, and to restore them to life in community with others. New Testament scholar Richard Hayes points out that following Jesus means caring for the poor because, as Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew 25, just as you did to one of these, the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And as N.T. Wright points out, the people of Israel wanted justice. And Jesus offered them justice and righteousness. But what he offered them wouldn't come from battles against physical enemies. It was not based on anger or violence. This justice, this righteousness, would come from Jesus putting the world right by defeating the power of evil when he died on that cross and he rose. And this justice, this righteousness, would come from Jesus' followers loving the world because of how they had experienced the love of God. So what does it mean to hunger and thirst for righteousness? And why would someone who hungers and thirsts be blessed? Hungering and thirsting for righteousness means wanting to be a better person, knowing you have shortcomings, failures, that you're messed up, what the Bible sometimes calls sin, and knowing that, knowing that because of this, you're separated from God and your neighbors, but wanting to be better and wanting to be in relationship, wanting to be justified or made righteous, wanting to be right with God, to be more Christ-like, or to have your relationships with your neighbors restored. Does this describe you? Do you know your shortcomings, your failures, the way your behavior sometimes misses the mark? Uh, 
Are you aware of a power of evil that sometimes seems to keep you captive? So that you do things you wish you didn't do? Or you don't always do the good things you'd like to do? Would you like to be more loving, more Christ-like? If that describes you, Jesus says that you are blessed. That you are blessed because you will be filled. Your hunger and thirst will be satisfied. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, you can be forgiven, you can be set free from everything that separates you from God and your neighbors. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ in you, you can be a little Christ, sharing the love of God with those who need it. In Christ, God will satisfy your hunger and your thirst. Amen.